Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope and Anchor Church. Glad to see you here today. Looking forward to worshiping King Jesus with you together. I hope you've had a, a, a good week that you've been able to see how God's been at work in you and around you uh, in all your interactions and those experiences you've had this week, good and bad. Uh, that's what I love about the work of the Holy Spirit is that God is able to meet us and take all that we've endured, all that we've experienced, the, the things that brought us joy, the things that caused us pain, and bring them all uh, and redeem them. And so I pray that we would have the courage and the, the desire to see those things redeemed today, that we would be able to lift those, gather those together and offer those to Jesus today and say, take this, take this and do more than I could ask or imagine so that you might be glorified, that I might be healed and that others might be blessed. So that's my prayer today and I pray that you'd join with me in that. So. Uh, here at Hope and Anchor Church, we will glorify God and make disciples by leveraging our diverse giftings and experiences, our hospitality and our community connections in a context of generational trauma and poverty, wariness of the church, and rejection of truth because we have a passion for creativity, for the pursuit of truth, and care for the alienated and overlooked. Here at Hope and Anchor Church, we view the giving of tithes and offerings as an intimate expression of faith and worship this is one of the very intimate uh ways that we get to worship uh worship and trust god and so uh here we've got several ways that you can give your tithes and offerings there's baskets in the room there's an ipad back there uh you can also go online go on planning center and give but uh basically when we think of all the ways that we can come together and worship that's one of those ways so we want to make sure that we provide ways for you to worship uh, accordingly so uh, i have asked kelly read our gathering prayer this morning so if you'll please stand god of the nations to your table all are invited and in your family no one is a stranger satisfy the hunger of those gathered in this house of prayer and mercifully extend to all the peoples on earth the joy of salvation and faith grant this through our lord jesus christ your son who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the holy spirit god forever and ever amen
we believe in these things, God, I pray that you would help us to worship you.
All right, good morning once again. It's great to see you here at Hope and Anchor Church. I'm excited today to continue in our learning adventure called Imprint 2022. This is our, uh, our, our, our learning adventure through the classic Christian spiritual disciplines. This is week number 12, I believe, or 11, or 12. I don't remember what week this is, actually. Might be 11. I think it's 11. But anyway, today we are doing the second part of our study on those outward disciplines, uh, solitude and silence. Solitude and silence. Last week we really did a deeper dive into solitude. Today we're going to kind of balance that out with discussion about the purpose and the value of intentional times of silence. We're going to talk about why it's necessary, maybe especially in the life of faith, to be careful about always being on, about always feeling necessary, about always having to talk and, and be about things, but really to value going away and being quiet and listening in our faith. So I think it'll be time well spent. Uh, this may come as a surprise. I'm full of surprises, guys. This may come as a surprise, but the life in Christ is a life of tension, of tension, uh, of a balance, a tenuous balance sometimes between many things, things like faith and action, belief and doubt, tenacity and surrender, certainty and mystery, fellowship, solitude, the sacred and the mundane, of speech and of silence. Have you picked up on this, that we're kind of called in this, this place that, that calls us to both things at the same time and we find out it's like, wow, there's a lot of tension here. Is this surprising to you? Have you thought about this before? Have you recognized it? Has, has this ever really caught you off guard? I mean, sometimes we can take things that surprise us in the faith and really switch to self-condemnation pretty quickly. It's like, well, I feel this. This isn't what I expected, so I must be doing it wrong. Well, hear me say, you're not doing it wrong. The life spent following after Jesus leads you into challenging places. Sometimes it feels like conflict. Sometimes it feels like tension. Sometimes this just doesn't seem to resolve. And we don't know what to do with that. C.S. Lewis illuminates something here when he writes, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly do not recommend Christianity. Have you heard him say that before? If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. Why? Because it doesn't always resolve. You have to be a, uh, working toward a certain level of maturity in your faith where you're able to tolerate and live with a certain sort of tension. But here's the problem. Sometimes in our church experience, we are sold a version of the Christian faith that explains everything. We are handed a version of the Christian faith in which all, uh, in which all conflict is resolved. Uh, and everything is tied up with a nice bow on top. I mean, when that happens, praise the Lord. I love it. I love it when it's like just slam dunk, like, all right, see you next week. That was fun, right? Sometimes that happens, but oftentimes it doesn't. Is this all resolved, no tension, nice, pretty bow on top? Is that the picture of the life in Christ that the Bible paints for us? Is this sort of experience what Jesus told us to expect, especially in the end times? Is this experience what Christians are experiencing globally is this what Christians, Christ followers, have experienced historically? I don't know. I've been reading a lot about the early church fathers and about all the martyrs. And I don't know if they would say, well, that ties up nicely with the bow as they're smoldering on the stake, you know, over the flames or being drawn and quartered. I mean, I don't know if they'd be like, oh, this, this feels right. So what do we do when things don't resolve? What do we do when the tension is our constant companion? Something we have to learn to live with if, and maybe because we are following after Jesus further up and further into his kingdom. 
What do we do when we are uncomfortable in our Christian faith? How do we cope with the dichotomies that present themselves in our faith? Well, I don't have a nice packaged bow on top answer for you. <laughs> That'd be kind of silly, right? <laughs> it just ties up nicely. There you go. But among other things, I think the answer is this. It is the practice of the spiritual disciplines that help ground us and help us become stronger and help us develop that maturity that is required for us to continue to grow in Christ-likeness, to live with him, to learn from him, to suffer with him, so that we might become more and more equipped, better and better outfitted for life in his kingdom. The answer, among other things, like spirit, uh, scripture study and meditation and prayer, things we've talked about, fasting, uh, is found in cultivating the spiritual disciplines of solitude and silence. Uh, Donald Whitney explains biblical reality calls us to family, fellowship, evangelism, and ministry for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. And yet, through the Holy Spirit, deep calls to deep in such a way that there is a part of our spirit that craves silence and solitude. Is there something in your soul that's craving silence and solitude in your life? I mean, maybe at multiple levels, but at a deeper spiritual level, when I talk about solitude and silence, something in you is like, yes, please. Yes, please. That'd be great. Solitude, silence. Solitude sounds good to our soul. Why? Because solitude is a refuge. It is the refuge that God offers to us as an escape from our noisy world, but also from our often noisy faith. In solitude, we begin to discover the power and the necessity of silence, of silence. Donald Whitney continues, and I love this, listen here. As sleep and rest are needed each day for the body, so silence and solitude are needed each day for the soul. These disciplines have a way of airing out the mind and ironing out the wrinkles of the soul. Do you love that imagery? It's like, man, when we have time to just sit and be alone with God in solitude, in silence, we're able to open the windows, let the room air out a little bit, and the wrinkles, iron out the wrinkles of our soul. That's great. That's the magnet I want on my refrigerator or the bumper sticker on my car. It's like, Jesus wants to air out your mind or wrinkle out the iron. Wait, iron out the... <laughs> that, that, that went well. Okay. So silence teaches us the power and meaning of words, both in our relationship with God and with each other. Silence teaches us the value and meaning, the power and the meaning of our words in our relationship with God and with each other. Our words, our words, they communicate. They communicate affection. They communicate longings, hopes, fears, intentions, confession, repentance in our life with God. Our words, uh, they can encourage, they can express, they can strengthen and they can sharpen others, but our words can also get in the way. Our words can cause harm. Our words can distract us from what actually needs to be said, what needs to be heard most in those life-giving relationships. Maybe you've been hurt by words before. You know, we grew up saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. False. False, man, I've been hit with sticks and with stones, and the deepest hurts I've endured have been the words. Can we stack hands on that? Yeah. Words hurt on three. One, two, three. Words hurt. You're not a sissy. You're not weak if the words that have been launched at you have really damaged you and hurt you. Man, give me the sticks and stones any day. I'll take those over the words. Words can hurt. We've all been there. We've all been the one talking carelessly. We have all been the one saying unnecessary things. We found ourselves responding to awkward silence. Is there anyone here that can't stand awkward silence? So they feel like they need to just stuff it full of their own words? Yeah, it happens. We've all been there in those awkward silences, filling the space with thoughtless speech and with our nervous jabbering. Nervous jabbering. Man, I got all kinds of phrases today. The nervous jabbering that we feel sometimes that we find ourselves doing. Other times, 
we have felt called upon to give input and to provide counsel. So we, so we do our best to rise to the occasion and we, and we start rattling off all of our thoughts and all of our feelings and all of our insights. It's easy for us, especially as people like pastors, to find ourselves stuck in problem solver mode. People aren't just sharing their feelings, right? They, they want those feelings fixed. They need answers. And I'm the Bible answer man, you know? Uh, so we slip into, into problem solver mode and our mouths run away from us. And it's not just pastors. I think it's guys. Guys, uh, any married men in here, have you ever found yourself stuck in problem solver mode and found that you weren't necessary? You weren't needed as a problem solver to your wife. Okay. Have you ever found yourself mansplaining? Which, ladies, mansplaining is when, a, when you take two words, you put them together, man explaining and make mansplaining. It's called a, it's called a, a, a blended word or a, a portmanteau is actually the, the grammar word for it. Now you know. <laughs> that was my favorite part of the whole message. All right, see you later. I mansplained mansplaining to you. Sometimes with the best of intentions, our mouths simply run away with us. Our mouths simply run away with us. Uh, we see this happening in the Bible. Example number one, Job's friends. Job's friends, their helpful silence versus their unhelpful words. Let's look at Job chapter 2, verses uh, 11 through 13. And you remember what happened to Job, right? Bad stuff. Loss. He lost everything. His home, his, his, his fortune, his children, his livestock, his health everything. When three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy Job had suffered, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Their names were Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. When they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. Wailing loudly, they tore their robes and threw dust in the air over their heads to show their grief. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. Ugh, how great is that? They wailed, they mourned, and then they sat with him silently for seven days. Man, how healing was that? But, you know, they started off well by sitting with Job for seven days patiently in silence. But then, then they started talking. And most of the rest of Job is like his friends, like, well, it must be because you did this. It must have been because you, uh, you know, you listened to secular music. Or you, you, you know, you went to the dance with your girlfriend and didn't leave room for Jesus, you know, or whatever. You know, it's like they're trying to just grasp at straws. Like, here's what, here, there's got to be a reason here, Job. We're going to help you figure it out. And Job's like, no, no, that doesn't make sense. That isn't what happened. No, no, no. It's just words, 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 the rest of the book. They started talking and talking. They were trying to help get to the bottom of why this terrible thing happened to Job. So we can think about Job's story with his friends and how their mouths just ran away with them. The second example is uh, the one time I told a girl that I worked with that she reminded me of the best man in my wedding. I seriously wasn't trying to be offensive and she did kind of look like the best man in my wedding. But it's like my, I started saying the words before my brain was like engaged and it's just like asking a woman when that baby's due, you know? And it's like, ah, oh, I can't go back, you know? Uh, so what did I do? Did I say, I'm sorry, you don't look like my best man in my wedding. I was drunk. I was lying. <laughs> no, I said, oh, no, no. I mean, he's really handsome. And you're, uh, yeah, you're like a female version of, where do you go? <laughs> After you've told a girl that she looks like the best man in your wedding. And so I just kept going deeper and deeper. And my wife's pointed out I had this problem. But uh, finally, it just kind of ended with an awkward, like, you know, just like exit stage left, like I'm going to go uh, vomit now. <laughs> yeah, so I started off trying to give an ill-considered compliment and it just went from bad to worse. So maybe because of things like Job's friends and maybe my experience telling a girl she looked like my best man. This is why, according to the Internet, all kinds of wise people have said this one thing. Mark Twain has said it, Abraham Lincoln has said it, Confucius has said it, Solomon, Galileo, Ben Franklin have all said, it is better to remain silent and be thought a fool 
than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> it is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. We've all found ourselves in that place. Maybe you've not told a, a female friend that she looked like a man. But you found yourself talking unnecessarily. You found yourself talking hurtfully. You found yourself gossiping. You found yourself taking jabs, slaying reputations, uh, jabbing other people out of fear, out of anxiety, out of insecurity, or out of jealousy. But here's what we know. Healthy people, they don't enjoy doing that. If we're speaking from a place of health and vitality, we don't need to do that. Healthy people don't enjoy gossip. Healthy people don't enjoy harming people with their words. But you, just like me, when we're hurt, when we're jealous, when we're scared, or when we feel threatened, we lose control, and far too often, that's when the verbal bullets fly. All of us have ways that we respond to threats. We, we respond to this uh, uh, fear that we feel sometimes where we feel disrespected some of you respond with actions I respond with my mouth I've got a very quick temper and a very quick tongue and if I'm not careful man the bullets start to fly and when that happens what are we left with well we're left with regrets we're left with broken trust hurt friendships and a sort of emotional and spiritual deadness inside we feel like something has not just been injured in the person we were aiming at, but something's been injured inside of us too because it ought not be happening in us. So let's turn to God's word. Oh, yes, let's turn to God's word and, and listen. Listen to the wisdom that punctuates all of its pages, it seems. Listen to God's wisdom and the warnings he has regarding the power of Words, the power of words. I've asked several people in the room to be my readers today, just so you don't have to listen to me read all these verses. But we're going to do kind of a, a panorama, a jamboree, if you will, of Bible verses. So first, listen to the pow what, what the scriptures tell us about the power of words from James chapter 3, verses 2 through 12. I don't remember who I gave that one to. Okay, let her rip. All right, so James, have a, has, James has a very specific understanding about the tongue. Be careful. Be careful with it. It's dangerous. It's powerful. Okay, uh, James 126. Your religion is worthless. Wow. Matthew 5, 21 through 24. All right. Right, so our words have bearing on the condition of our soul. That we're in danger of hellfire if we call someone an idiot. If we harbor that attitude in our heart toward another of God's creations. 
another of God's image bearers. Uh, yeah, so it matters. Okay, uh, now we're going to get into Proverbs. Oh man, Proverbs is just chock full of wisdom about the tongue and his speech and stuff. So Proverbs 17, 27 through 28. All right, Kelly. A truly wise It's so good. All right, Proverbs 10, 10 through 14. People who wink at wrong cause trouble, but a bold reproof promotes peace. The words of the godly are a life giving fountain, the words of the wicked conceal violence and violence. Hatred stirs up quarrels, but make, the love makes up for all offenses. Wise words come from the lips of people with understanding, but those lacking sense will be beaten. Wise people treasure knowledge, but the babbling of a fool invites disaster. People who accept discipline are on the pathway to life, but those who ignore correction will go astray. Hiding hatred makes you a liar. Slandering others makes you a fool. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. The words of the godly are like sterling silver. The heart of a fool is worthless. The words of the godly encourage many, but fools are destroyed by their lack of Okay, that was actually Proverbs 10, 10 through 14 and 17 through 21. I forgot to mention that. Okay, how about Proverbs 12, 13 through 19? The wicked are trapped by their own words, but the godly escape such trouble. Wise words bring many benefits, and hard work brings rewards. Fools think of their own way as right, but the wise listen to others. A fool is quick-tempered. But a wise person stays calm when insulted. An honest witness tells the truth. A false witness tells lies. Some people may come <coughs> but the words of the wise bring healing. Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are soon, but lies are soon exposed. All right, one more. Proverbs 18, 4 through 8. Wise words are like deep waters. Wisdom flows from the waters like a bubbling brook. It is not right to acquit the guilty or deny justice to the innocent. Fools' words get them into constant quarrels. They are asking for a beating. The mouth of fools are their room. They trap themselves with their lips. And rumors are dainty morsels that sink deep into one's heart. One thing I can't help but think is, according to the Proverbs, the writer of the Proverbs, what is the result of the words I'm putting out there each day? Is it leading to gossip, to quarrels, to, to conflict, to pain? I mean, it's like, uh, wait, what is the fruit that my words that I'm putting out into the world are producing? Uh, is it the words of a fool or is it the words of a wise person? So I had a lot of wisdom there from scripture. So here's an assumption that I am comfortable in making today. One, or here's the assumption, deep down, we all desire to have friends and please God, right? Show of hands, anyone different than that, right? We all desire to have friends and please God with our lives. So how do we discipline ourselves so that our words do those things? They please God and they bless others instead of causing offense, division, and separation. How can we become familiar with the healing power of silence? So what is silence? What's our working definition in this series of silence? Well, in silence, we are tuning our hearts to hear God speak, discerning when our input is necessary, and knowing what words we should rightly speak to God and to the people in our lives. I'll read that again. In silence, we are tuning our hearts to hear God speak, discerning when our input is necessary, and knowing what words we should rightly speak to God and to the people in our lives. Basically, it comes down to this, Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 19, verse 14. This is the necessary starting point when we consider the practice of silence. Look at that, Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. If that is the measuring stick we start out with, this is the measure, how we calibrate what we're about to say or not say. 
We start here. We say, God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you first and foremost because you are my rock and my redeemer. Let us anchor everything we're saying, everything we're offering up. May it come from that place. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the necessary starting point for us. Beginning by laying all of our words, all of the meditations of our hearts before God, asking him to search them and refine them, to uh, refine them even before they are spoken. This is so very wise. How do we become wise like the writer of the Proverbs indicates? Start here. Lay it all before God and say, search this, refine this, God. Desiring to please and honor God with our words and our meditations has an incredibly shaping effect on us. If you're conscious to lay it all before God, it has a very uh, important guiding effect on the things we end up saying, the, in, the things we end up thinking, and the things we end up being about in our daily life. Donald Whitney explains it this way. He says, how can the disciplines of silence and solitude teach tongue control? On a long fast, you discover that much of the food you normally eat is really unnecessary. When you practice silence and solitude, you find that you don't need to say many things that you think you need to say. In silence, we learn to rely more on God's control in situations where we normally feel compelled to speak or to speak too much. We find out that he is able to manage situations in which we once thought our input was indispensable. The skills of observation and listening are also sharpened in those who practice silence and solitude so that when they do speak, there is more of a freshness and depth to their words. Maybe you've known someone like this. They rarely speak, but when they do, everyone falls silent because they're not going to waste their words. Their words are not going to fall to the ground. They're going to say something and it's going to be meaningful and it's going to be solid. You know people like that. May we all become more like that. So how do we do that? Well, I want to give you three things today. Three tips, hot takes, whatever. How to cultivate a habit of silence or how to practice the ministry of the closed mouth. Okay, some of us are called in, all of us are called into that ministry, right? Are you called to ministry? Yeah, you're called to the ministry of the closed mouth sometimes, right? Stop, beware, and think. Stop, beware, and think. Okay, stop. Stop talking so much. Discipline yourself. Go on a diet of words, okay? Stop talking so much. Intentionally practice silence. Train yourself to to have intentional time each day where you're just forced to be quiet. You don't check, you don't write online, you don't do anything, you just practice silence. You schedule periods of silence and of listening, you commit to it every day. You avoid, like the plague or COVID, avoid listening to or speaking sinful gossip. Don't be an audience to hurtful words. It be, it'll be awkward, I guarantee it, when someone you know and like is like starts unfurling some uh, nasty gossip. You're like, oop, I'm out. I'm on a diet. Of, I'm on a gossip diet, sorry. You know, it's hard, but I mean, remove yourself. Don't give an audience to the person who's saying hurtful words. Practice it. And I guarantee that'll change the temperature in the room, right? It'll change the temperature in that conversation when you walk away like, I'm allergic to gossip. Refuse to participate in pointless chatter and pointless debates, whether in person or online. And then at the end of it, before you go to bed, what would it be like if you proofread your day? To actually intentionally say, God, I'm going to proofread my day. I'm going to read back through the script of my life today. I'm going to evaluate my conversations. I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to critique the manuscript to convict me and to bring correction and encouragement so that tomorrow I'm better prepared to glorify you and bless others when I go out into the world and open my big yapper. Seek accountability with someone who is reliable and someone who is familiar with the practice of silence. Okay, find someone to help you and to ask you how you're doing. Okay, be vulnerable in that. Okay, so stop, stop, stop talking so much. Second, beware. Beware the danger of feeling necessary. 
Beware of feeling necessary. What do I mean by that? Well, we love to be wanted. We love to feel wanted, to feel important, to feel indispensable. We want to feel unique in our skills and our abilities. And at root, we just love to be heard. We love to be convinced. We are self-convinced that our opinion is, is very needed. And this can lead to us always giving input, always being engaged, always being on. Never being off. <laughs> You're always on. Uh, we see this happening on the internet. We see this happening in social media. We see this happening with pastors. We see this happening with other leaders. There's always someone that's always on. And they're always contributing. And you kind of get this sense like, oh, just go for a walk. Just take a break, man. Come up for air. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We see it happening. We can end up always assuming that we are necessary. And it can cause us to... Uh, it can cause otherwise normal, uh, normal people to become arrogant. It can cause otherwise normal, well-adjusted people to become prideful and annoying. As uh, Eugene Peterson in the message call, calls it, people can become bloated windbags. <laughs> bloated windbags. Look at uh, in the message. I've got a reader here. I've got Nick. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Listen to what he's saying it's going to be like in the end times. Don't be naive. There are difficult times ahead. As the end approaches, people are going to be self-absorbed, money-hungry, self-promoting, <coughs> stuck-up, profane, indigenous of parents, crude, coarse, dog-eat-dog, -dog, unbending, <coughs> slanderers, impulsively wild, savage, cynical, treacherous, ruthless, bloated windbags, addicted to lust, God. They'll make a show of religion, but behind the scenes, they're animals. Stay clear of these people. <laughs> if we're not careful, we can, we can become part of the problem instead of the solution. By feeling so necessary, we can start to always be on and always contributing, and we end up becoming a bloated windbag. A bloated windbag. There's nothing about that that sounds attractive. I mean, there's no way to inflect. There's no syllables to emphasize that make that sound better. You know, bloated windbag, bloated windbag, bloated windbag. No, it never gets better. I don't want to be a bloated windbag. I don't want you to be a bloated windbag in the world, especially when there's so much good to be done. In order to be like Jesus, we must be disciplined enough to step back, to fall silent, and let silence speak from time to time. You know one of the most powerful stories about Jesus uh, defending a woman there's the story of the uh, men caught in hypocrisy, where they dragged the woman before Jesus and say, hey, she was caught in adultery. Uh, they're trying to accuse her, say the law says she should be stoned. Jesus eventually talks, but when he, when he does talk, it drops like a 10,000 pound bomb. Because first, what did he do? You remember in John chapter uh, eight, it says that Jesus stood there, <coughs> He stooped down, and what did he do? He just drew in the dirt. And there's speculation about what he drew. But there's this silence. He let linger. He let it hang there in the air, and everyone's just kind of like, and? You know, tossing their rocks. They're like, come on, give it to us, Jesus. He makes them wait. Then he stands up, and what does he say? I see your rocks. You without sin? Cast the first stone. You blasted hypocrites. He didn't say that. That's, that's my paraphrase. But the silence set the stage. Jesus was a, willing to let that awkwardness hang so that when he says, you without sin, cast the first stone. And how do the hypocrites respond? Starting with the oldest down to the youngest. They dropped the rocks and they went home. The silence set the stage for what Jesus was about to say and it pierced them to the heart. And they went home. When we balance our words with silence, they too speak more loudly. Also, we will be more inclined to remain humble and to stay rooted in God's power and to enjoy a more restful soul when we don't feel like we always have to lead by talking, by saying stuff. So, stop. Stop talking so much. 
beware, beware the feeling of uh, the danger of feeling necessary. And then third, think, think before speaking, think before speaking, before your take, before you take your mouth off safety and you lift your tongue to speak, ask yourself, is what I'm about to say, T, is it true? H, is it helpful? <coughs> I, am I involved? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? You see what I did there? It's an acronym. Think, T-H-I-N-K, is what I'm about to say, is it true? Is it helpful? Am I involved? Is it necessary? And is it kind? You see, God has called us to be agents of gospel hope. We are to be agents of healing and restoration in the world. We are the way that God is responding to all the brokenness in the world. His church is his response to all of the division and all of the hatred and all of the hurt. We are sent out on mission to be agents of gospel, hope, healing, and reconciliation. It is truly against our new nature in Jesus Christ to willingly, to willfully cause hurt. If you're enjoying hurting someone, breaking the trust of others carelessly with reckless speech, you're not following Jesus. I mean, we all stumble, we all fall in that area, but if you're finding joy and glee in hurting others, you're not walking in the way of Jesus, so repent. <laughs> Have you been hurt by reckless speech? Who is it who's been hurt by your careless words? Who this week do you need to go to and make amends, to apologize, to seek forgiveness? Who can you bless this week with silence? These are good questions, right? I mean, consider them because we all live day to day, minute by minute, interacting with people. Sometimes we do great honoring God. Sometimes we don't do so great and we dishonor God. So we need to reflect and make amends. So Donald Whitney, uh, he, he helps us close up shop uh, today. <laughs> he says, perhaps you need to get alone with God. Perhaps you need to get alone with God and deal with some doubts and questions. Maybe you have come to a crisis of faith that needs time for prayer, deep thinking, and much soul searching. There's too much at stake to neglect the matter or to deal with it superficially. If your body had an emergency, you would take the necessary time to deal with it. Don't do anything less for an emergency of the soul. Don't do anything less for an emergency of the soul. I wonder if our avoidance of silence stems from a soul emergency. Some of you, if you're really honest right now, say, yeah, I feel like there's some sort of a four alarm fire going on inside of my soul. I'm familiar with a soul emergency. I think I'm feeling one right now. Perhaps we're afraid of what we would discover if we were to truly enter into silence, into that quiet place alone with God, what will we hear? What would we be forced to confront if we lingered in those awkward silences that God oftentimes uh, allows to persist? What would we find? What discomfort would we uh, experience? What will happen if we don't give input? What will happen if I don't share my opinion? What will happen if I'm not so necessary? Who am I if I'm not talking? Who am I if I'm not contributing my opinion? What if we are forced to examine our motives and our attitudes? What if we are required to wait for God to speak, wait for God to move in our hearts, for him to truly become our rock and our redeemer? This week, may, may you find the courage to step away from the chatter and the noise and may you enter the peace of God. May you find him there and hear him speak to your emergency of the soul. May you think before speaking. May there be a freshness and depth to your words because those words are the fruit of practiced silence flowing from God's presence. What if God's desire for you today was to, for you to come close? to be still and to listen for a while. What would you do if you knew that God was waiting? In the silence, God was waiting. 
What could be more inviting and more necessary than quiet time with your creator today? May the words of our mouths and may the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is so full of wisdom. And so often that wisdom guides us to do less and not more, to say less, not more. So God, I pray that uh, you would drive this truth deep in our heart. Uh, help us identify the reasons why we've been avoidant of silence. We've been avoidant of sitting quietly with you. We've been avoidant of not saying what we think all the time. Lord, train our hearts in this. Help us discipline ourselves as we go on a diet of words, as we fast from uh, pointless chatter and gossip. May we be people who emerge each day as we go out into our workplace, into school, wherever it is, our circle of friends. May we emerge from a, from a, from a sanctuary, a place of silence, of stillness, of healing and wholeness. As we've listened closely, as we've gone to your word, as we've listened in prayer, as we sought the wise counsel of others, as we practiced the ministry of the closed mouth, God, teach this lesson to my heart. God, I pray for my friends here who are enduring, experiencing an emergency of their souls. And sometimes they're just talking, they're chattering, they're avoiding the silence because they're afraid, they're frantic. So God, I pray that they would feel the Holy Spirit on them right now, that they would uh, just calm down just sit still to be quiet for maybe the first time in a little in a long time may we rest in your presence may we know the value of silence and how that will lend power and freshness and depth to the words we speak god may we be more like jesus in this and in so many other ways god would you be with us as we commit to practicing solitude and silence so that we might grow to be more like jesus we trust that you're faithful in this. So ours is just to show up. So I pray that you'd help us do that. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. We're going to worship a bit more. And this is a chance for you to, uh, to sit with the Lord. You can sing along. Or you can just be quiet. Just listen. Maybe read that passage in uh, Psalm 19, verse 14. Maybe make that your meditation. Read that over and over. Lay all of your thoughts, all of your words, all of your actions before the Lord and say, God, redeem this. Let me build it upon you as the rock, as my foundation. Either way, make the most of this opportunity.
Well, if there's nothing else, let's stand and praise the Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. All praise to God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is beyond uh, it's pure and undefiled and behind, beyond the reach of damage and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power. And you receive the salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon.